carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good morning, good morning, and welcome to an autumnal African dawn. This is Safari Live. It is very nice to be back here, everybody. My name is James Henry. If you haven't met me, Herman is on camera today. Herman, show us your thumb. There we go. There it is. It's quite a long thumb, a bit like Viam's. Uh, it's quite interesting. It's about the same width as well. Herman, of course, is the width of a, a tent pole. Uh, he he hid behind one yesterday during the fireside chat, so that was quite interesting. In the final control, we have Kirsten Max Smith. She's being ably assisted, I think, by Geraldine the Cheesecake Kent. And on the other vehicle, a very, very exciting morning for David, whose surname I actually don't know. A new David who is going to be interviewing today, so please be nice to him. Of course, his name is Fraser. That's a good Scottish name. Let's find out if he's got good Scottish instincts out here. I'm not sure what those are, actually. Uh, I did make a mistake. Louise is, in fact, assisting in the final control. Geraldine is up, though. I did see her knocking about the camp earlier. So everyone is up, very excited about the day. She apparently is going to be reporting on the Taylor will be out on foot a little bit later when there's a bit of light for her to see what's going on. Right, as we drive I will tell you how you might get hold of us. The best way to get hold of us is hashtag Safari Live and that is the way to get hold of us on Twitter. Twitter, of course, the social media site. If you're unfamiliar with it, you'll figure it out. It's not very difficult. We've come into this area because I had Impala alarm calling at four o'clock this morning when I was taking the first sip of my coffee and reading my book on human origins, which was a very interesting, uh, well, I had a very interesting morning doing that, but obviously that was now an hour ago that they were knocking about here alarm calling. I don't know what it was. There were some tracks of hyenas a little bit earlier on. Perhaps the wild dogs have come here, perhaps some lions. We'll find out as the light starts to fill the earth. There is a bird of prey, Herman. Do you see it? I do. It just flew. It just flew. Yeah. Ah. There you go. I believe it to be a brown snake eagle. Well done, Herman. Hopefully that's not the only bird we'll see today. Right. Now, Morning Glory, you said you saw a male lion walking on the dam cam moving from the north to the south. That's good stuff, thank you for that. Can you tell us what time that was? Any time between, I suppose, 7 o'clock yesterday evening and now. It was that obviously quite close now. Quarter to four. So it could well have been that male lion that was causing the consternation amongst the impala that were making loud snorting noises at four o'clock this morning and of course there is a full moon around or fullish moon and that means that we could easily have dogs moving before the dawn so it is possible that they are around i don't know why i thought of wild dogs of course given that impala don't do a great deal of alarming at wild dogs I suspect it was probably that lion. Anyway, he could be pretty much most of the way to Cape Town by now if he, won't, if he walked past here an hour and a bit ago. I suppose I should use the spotlight. I don't know why I have an objection to a spotlight. It's probably because I'm not very good at using it. Oh. There. We have a bird. Do you see it, Herman? It is static on the road. Ah, well spotted. That is the Natal Spurfowl. And it is, well, probably trying to avoid the moisture in the grass, which dovetails very nicely with James's question about whether I'm surprised or not by the water. James, I'm not surprised. Um, I have been following developments here, so I know that there's been lots of... Ooh. That's a 
little morning squawk for you. I think calling that a song would be very strong. So James, I'm not that surprised by it. I am impressed though by the amount of growth that has occurred in the short time that I've been away. We made our way to the tent yesterday for this for Brian's farewell chat and it was astounding to see how much more grass there is, how the Waltheria plants have grown up. <laughs> and I was very distressed to see how Matilda the Mantis, I'm afraid, is no longer with us uh, on her plant. I suspect because there's so many other places she could be. Righty, so that is the Natal Spur Fowl. We'll continue on around the corner here. I'll tell you where we are. The camps are just over to the right hand side of where we are now. We're heading down in Vubu Road towards the Vuyatela Dam. Perhaps that male lion is still around there. I'm not sure. Oops. We are of course driving Jigger, which means the tyres are bolder than the ones that Lewis Hamilton uses on his Formula One car. So we do slip and slide a little Alrighty, we're going to have to reboot this car now. Let us head straight across to David Fraser. Please be nice to him and I will see you on the other side of his introduction. Good morning, my name is David Fraser. You're watching Safari Live. This is actually my interview drive, so I'm uh, very, very excited to be here up in the Kruger. I'm not from this area, so I may actually call on you guys to give me some help on this uh, morning safari. Um, the sun hasn't quite risen yet, so it's still nice and dark. It's actually not that cold this morning. Yesterday it was quite chilly. Today it's quite uh, nice and warm. Of course, you're welcome to send through your questions, hashtag Safari Live, and uh, you can give me a grilling. <laughs> I'm going to start driving now. We've seen some tracks. We just saw some uh, hyena tracks um, leading away, so we're going to follow them and see what we can find. Let's go! One more very important fact on this vehicle is that my cameraman's name is Dave too. Yes. <laughs> Bring it in Dave. Peace and love. Dave squared. Double D. There you go. <laughs> All right, I'm going to slow down so we can keep an eye on the road at the same time as we're moving along. I seem to have already lost the hyena tracks. Um, Animals obviously love to use the road. It's a lot easier than walking through the bush and a lot safer, less chance of stepping on a snake. Uh, but they don't always stick to the roads and sometimes will we'll cut through the bush, uh, which makes tracking a little bit more difficult. And may, I may even have to get off the vehicle just now. But we're gonna keep going. Um, I actually don't even know where we're going. Dave is my guide. Um, he's my sat nav. And we're going to uh, see if we can find a nice water hole with something that I can show you. Mm. Right, James, you've asked what is my favorite animal? <sighs> well, let me switch off for that one. <laughs> That's quite a big question. Well, I'm gonna actually have to go with two animals. One would be the black mamba. Okay, it's fast, it's dangerous, it's the, the largest uh, venomous snake in South Africa or even Africa. And apart from that, I'd have to say the black rhino, a bejan. Again, fast, dangerous, unpredictable. Um, and there's something special about that because you don't become complacent with them. When you find a black rhino, every time it is special, every time I, my heart starts to race and I get excited. Uh, and of course it's a highly endangered uh, you know, and very rare animal. And so I think a black rhino is uh, something that um, I have not gotten over. Um, every time you find a black rhino, uh, for me it's, it's a special moment. 
Hope that answers your question, James. Alright, we're going to be switching back to James. Apparently he has got an amazing bird to show you. Well, it's certainly a bird. It is uh, the heron, the grey heron, and a juvenile version thereof, sitting above what is a very full Weir Taylor Dam, which is quite cool to see. And I think that this heron is searching out the frogs that are calling, or were calling, just below where he's sitting. He looks like he's had a very good meal. Indeed, he's got a very full crop. And I think during the course of the day, if I was a heron, this would be a perfect place for me to be. I wouldn't be moving too far from here. There seems to be lots to eat as a result of the water. I do apologise for losing a bit of signal back then. We've got a couple of technical glitches going on. And of course, that's what makes this show really quite, um, well, essential. The more, that, you know, our daily safaris, the technical difficulties of doing what we do are quite astounding and well beyond my understanding. So I thank you for your patience and I thank you also for being nice to David. Apparently you were nice to him so that's important. Please keep being nice to him for the course of the day. Of course 99.999% of you who watch the show are in fact very nice to us all the time. Now I've got actually something quite interesting to say to you and that is that I don't think that that is a grey heron. I suspected that it might be one of these, but that's very unusual for this area. I think that's the juvenile black-headed heron. Look at the legs. The legs are grey. Sorry about that. So what we're looking at there is a juvenile black-headed heron. Now I'm not sure if that's a first or not for Safari Live. It's certainly a first for me on Safari Live. And so while you're looking at the bird, I'll just tell you what features we're watching out for there. We're looking out for the grey legs. We're looking out for the yellowish eye. The greyish beak. Uh, there's a yellow tinge to the beak though which is making me slightly confused but that head is distinctive the head there is very distinctive of the grey of the black headed heron I think that's very cool everybody that's not the bird we first saw the first one of course was definitely a bird of prey which I guessed was a brown snake eagle Hmm. So please tell me if you think that was if this is perhaps your first view of the black-headed heron on Safari Live. It's not a rare bird, but it's unusual for this area. Hmm. I'm just checking here. I'm just reading. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes, that's him. Ah, that's very nice. Now, Fuzzman Sparkles, excellent name that you have, of course. You say that first you had a Goliath heron with Taylor the other day. That's very cool to see in this area. Again, not uncommon in the sort of more well. well there's the dab chick. You see that little bird down there, Herman? It looks like a little duck in the water. Yes, ducks in the water swimming. Now gone. It's in amongst that veg. Yeah, you're in the right place. Yeah, just try and have a scan around there. Sorry, Fuzzman Sparkles. Wonderful that you've now had a Goliath heron as well. And then the black headed this morning. There it is. That's marvelous. Look at that. A grebe. A little grebe. Gorgeous bird, very unusual for this area, and of course Brent has had a number of unusual birds over the course of the rain, including the red-collared widow, which I last saw in this area during, well, a very heavy rainy season in the year 2007.
fact, it may have been 2008. That's fantastic. The little grebe or dab chick. Also, not an uncommon bird, but for this area, certainly not usual. And I know Brent mentioned that he'd seen this, so I know you've seen this bird already. But perhaps you weren't watching, or you haven't been watching, and this is a new one for your list. This is excellent. I'm afraid I've heard nothing by way of predatory sounds, and I'm not sure how far from where I'm sitting right now I'm going to be allowed to move, because we seem to have a few signal issues with this car, but we'll find out as the drive goes on. Now the little grebe, I suspect, is looking for water invertebrates to eat. Little water boatmen, of course, those water striders, back swimmers and the like. And they can dive. I'm just going to make sure that there isn't some kind of special thing that it likes to eat. Yes. Now it will eat frogs and tadpoles as well. I do wonder how my tadpoles have got on. They were released, of course, into the pan the day after our TV show ended. I wonder if they are now large and the ones calling just below here are in imminent danger from the black-headed heron. Good, Hermann, let us continue. Just stop wassailing over here. Well, Terry, you say the black-headed heron, remember, not a black heron, a black-headed heron, is your 237th bird out here. That is a very impressive return indeed. You know, that's definitely what it is. Excellent. Right, well, I shall look out for some male lion tracks. And while I do that, we'll head across to David, who is going to give you an update on what his plans are from here. Should I jump out? Right, welcome back. Um, we've just found some fresh Ellie dung um, with urine as well, so, and we've seen some very fresh uh, footprints as well. Um, so we're going to keep following them and maybe we can catch up with this elephant herd. Now I've heard really good things about you guys. Um, Safari Live viewers, apparently you really know what you're talking about, so I'm going to have to uh, pay attention this morning. Um, and of course I'm going to use that to my advantage and I'm definitely going to be throwing some questions at you um, when I get a little stuck. I'm not familiar with this area, I'm actually from Cape Town and I've spent the last couple of years working at private reserves in the Eastern Cape. Okay, so that's a little bit different uh, to the Kruger, where we are now. And you know, just now James asked me a question about my favorite animal. And I'm going to have to say one more thing. Um, in the Eastern Cape, where I work, I get to see black rhinos almost every day. So that's a massive privilege. But I'm dying to see a leopard. This area up here is world famous for leopards. And that is something that um, that will get my heart racing this morning. I'm hoping for a leopard. So, uh, yeah, let's get out there. Haven't seen any tracks yet. Um, we're definitely going to be, as I say, we've got these um, elephant tracks. We're going to be following that. But I think, uh, for me, number one, the leopard. Let's go. The sun has not risen yet. Anne asked me how long I've been guiding. Well, actually a, a really long time. Um, I'm older than I look, for starters. And I've actually worked in different fields. Um, actually starting with falconry. I studied falconry. And believe it or not, I actually did guiding as a falconer as well. We worked at a falconry center and I had to guide people around and explain uh, the rehabilitation process as well as doing shows, which is a form of guiding. Um, then I also spent a few years in a zoo where we did tours as well and a bit of time in Botswana at a snake park. But then I went into field guiding and I would say now I'm on about almost seven years of uh, bush experience um, doing um, actual safaris let me just pay attention while we go over these ruts and so yeah I've got a few years um, 
ranging experience. But uh, to be honest with you, I'm definitely a newbie to this area, and that makes it very exciting. I've spent, uh, the, as I say, the last uh, about six years in the Eastern Cape of South Africa, and that is a different biome to what we have here. And that means that everything is fresh for me. Um, the birds, the plants, the, the trees, everything is fresh and really exciting. Um, I'm, I've, already, I've only been here two days and already I've seen loads of bird species that I've actually never even seen in my life. So I'm in my element right now. Right, we're going to go left here. Ravi wants to know which animal made me choose my career. Well, to be honest with you, I have been obsessed um, with the natural world ever since I was a baby. I caught my first snake, uh, my first puff adder when I was five years old, and I've never stopped since. I've just been totally in love with it. And the more you learn, the more you want to learn more. Um, I was fortunate enough to be taken on safari as a child and if you had met me when I was just a little kid I would have told you I want to be a ranger. I even had a game ranger birthday party. So this is something that I've wanted to do my whole life and uh, I've actually always wanted to come up to the Kruger and this is obviously one of the most beautiful parts of the Kruger and I could not uh, even imagine a better way to do this. Um, I think Safari Live offers something totally new, um, you know, it, for me it's totally new, um, I'm used to dealing with guests, um, with a live audience, um, a camera like this, it, yeah, it make, it's making things quite interesting, I must say. So far I'm enjoying it, I hope you guys are too. <laughs> Alright, we're going to switch over to Taylor now. Good morning everybody, it is another fantastic day as you've heard from Dave and James already. It really is really nice out here today, but chilly, got a jersey on, but that won't stop us. Now my name is Taylor and on camera with me this fine sunny day is Craig and of course Herbert the, re the Protector is out making sure we stay safe. And at the moment, we've just found ourselves a big old herd of impala carrying on about the morning. I don't think they are enjoying the wet grass very much today and something seems to have caught their attention in the far west. Oh, I'm hearing all sorts of sounds this morning. You see that? Look how they're all staring. They haven't started alarming yet, but impala are very cautious creatures as the rest of the animals out here, besides warthogs I find. I find that they're not always on high alert, but impala definitely, and once one animal has spotted something, you'll see they all do that. They all turn and face in the same direction. And then, if it is a real threat, they're going to start that snorting, and then it sounds like popcorn popping. But nothing just yet. They've put their heads down, and they've carried on. So obviously, there's no threat over there. They were just being on alert. So we obviously got some information this morning, and I have to say thank you to all of you who are watching again for all of your help with uh, posting any information for animals were walking in the early hours of the morning while we were sleeping so nicely, so thank you for that. So we are going to follow up on that male lion that was seen. Herbie says that he knows exactly the route that that male lion walked. So we're going to take him up on that challenge this morning. And we're going to see if we can pick up his tracks and hopefully find him for James. And then send, of course, James on in. And then Herbert said something else that was quite interesting. He said he heard some lions calling and it sounded as though it was the whole pride. How exciting is that? Which pride? I'm not sure. Last night they didn't find the Nkuhumas. I checked around Arethusa, there was no tracks. They were last seen on Simbambili. We don't know, they could have easily snuck on to the property through Sandy Patch, through Impala Plains. They love those areas. It's not the first time we would have, would have not seen them sneak on like that. Or is it the Torchwood Pride? 
they've been hanging around they've just been in Biffle's hook so we never never know I'd be quite excited to see the Torchwood Pride with all those little cubs that they have at the moment it's quite a big pride it's seven lionesses and ten cubs which is so exciting I haven't seen a pride of lions that big for quite some time oh, no, I know I talk nonsense I did see a big pride I think it was the shish pride that I saw when I was up in the Kruger National Park uh, near Satara, somewhere around there. There was a big pride of lions in, lying in the long grass, but I didn't see all of them, I just saw a couple of them. But from what I hear, it's a massive pride that frequents Singita uh, on, on a regular basis. So that was quite nice to see different lions around here. But we're avoiding the grass for the moment because we're going to get very, very wet. So I think we'll do what the animals do and we'll just keep to our roads and the pathways. Bobby, you're wondering why the animals don't like the wet grass. Well, it's sort of the same reason as to why we wouldn't. You get cold afterwards, and even though they've got better insulation than what we do, it's, it's just not very pleasant to go moving through here. It's a bit chilly, a little bit of a breeze this morning, so it will make them a bit cold. Um, they don't mind it. I mean, you can still see the impala still moving around, but you see often in the mornings uh, when there is a bit of dew on the grass, you'll see the birds all walking on the road. You'll see the impala. When we'd actually first spotted them, they were out in the middle, just actually surrounding camp um, on, on the driveway, all standing there, chewing the cud, waiting for the sun to rise so that they can warm up a bit better. But like uh, everyone's been saying, it's not too bad. This jersey will have to come off probably in the next 15 minutes. It's not going to be cold at all. And that's winter for you. Winter is just amazing. So these are still the beginning stages, but you can definitely feel that that bite is back in the morning and in the evenings, which is, well, one of the definite signs that it has arrived. But it was just amazing how quickly the seasons change in this area. It's literally within a day or two. And uh, summer's gone, the afternoons are lovely, I'm so excited, everybody else is miserable around camp, freezing, ponchos on, scarves and beanies, and I'm going, I know, I know cold, I know frost. <laughs> Tristan's also sitting in final control this morning, and he's not happy with me, uh, saying that winter has arrived. Ha ha ha! But it's lovely though, you get to wrap yourself up in the duvet, and uh, have your heater on if you have a heater, or a uh, Jamie, my, my favourite is Jamie's trick that she, she was telling me about last night, there's a hot water bottle down the front of your jersey, I'm definitely going to be using that. There's nothing worse than trying to drive and do all sorts of things when you've got about 17 different layers on. You sort of become like the Eros man and you can't do anything and it's very uncomfortable. So if I can have one or two jerseys on, I will still be wearing shorts right through winter. I will show you. So, I <laughs> actually checked, chatting about it last night as we've taken the doors off the side of the cars, which is amazing. We loved that for summer. It was great. A little cool breeze came in. Stretch the legs. It's more comfortable on the back. Winter. That cool breeze is going to be getting inside the footwell and well, I may have to get a little blankie, just a little one, like James has got a blankie, I'll have to steal his idea, which was a good one, and wrap myself around it. Now I don't know if we're going to see any insects just yet, I reckon that they're all still sleeping for the moment, but it, when it does warm up it's going to be quite nice. But I've already heard, uh, well... The crowned lapwings are shouting again, but they're shouting at us, not at anything else. They always get upset when you, when you disturb them. But we're going to keep searching. We're going to hopefully pick up on some lion tracks. I think Herbie's managed to see something up ahead, so let me race on away. And I'm going to send you back across to Mr. Fraser, and hopefully those nerves have settled. Welcome back. I found something interesting to, to look at. A big beautiful marula tree and what I find interesting about it uh, that I've just noticed now is this line right here of mud okay and that is just at the right height for an elephant belly so I would say that an elephant came along here and used this marula tree as a scratching post right the Sun is just just popping out David and if you want to get that there it is our source of energy it's rising Birds are calling, you can hear a cape turtle dove serenading the morning. Alright, um, we actually just saw some fresh hyena tracks and Dave is guiding me towards their den. So I'm going to jump back in, we're going to head towards the hyena den and see if we get lucky. Hopefully um, they're still around, maybe um, we might even get to see one. <clears throat> Ah, 
Actually, while we were standing uh, looking at that tree, I heard um, an elephant in the distance. It sounded like a bit of a shriek sound that elephants sometimes make. In fact, that, that very sound reminds me of the sound that a young elephant makes when it's being weaned. Well, that's when its mom is trying to cut it off. It's a big baby, it's had uh, enough uh, milk, it's time for it to uh, you know, focus on proper food, vegetation, um, but the baby still wants milk. And what mom will do is it comes in from behind her front leg, tries to get to her nipple, and she'll cut it off. And that's when the babies uh, throw a bit of a tantrum, and that's what I think I heard, I recognized that sound. That sounded like a, a baby having a bit of a, a shout. Uh, so we're going to get going again, we're going to move towards the hyena den um, and hopefully we find some members okay Go. this wants to know what is the difference between Eastern Cape game reserves and the Kruger well a huge difference Okay, in the Eastern Cape, you're dealing with um, land that has uh, gone through quite a bit of uh, trauma in the past. In that area, the 1820 British settlers arrived, about 2,000 of them arrived to um, establish small farms, and unfortunately, um, they were very hard on the local wildlife. Um, elephants were, were reduced from thousands to, to just very few. Most uh, large game were actually wiped to locally extinct. Whereas the Kruger National Park has been a long protected area. And so you get to see uh, vegetation um, and animals that have not uh, been uh, disturbed. Whereas in the Eastern Cape, it's actually really exciting from a conservation point of view. Because what they're doing is they're taking this damage farmland now um, and they are converting it back to a uh, natural uh, game reserve and so that presents a lot of challenges um, so obviously vegetation alien invasive species have to be removed indigenous uh, species trees and grasses um, need to uh, be planted um, and of course a large game needs to be reintroduced which obviously presents a lot of challenges so Ecotourism in the Eastern Cape is a relatively new idea. You're talking only about uh, 25 years now um, that it has become a, a thing in the Eastern Cape. Whereas the Kruger National Park, this is where it began. Um, guiding and game ranging, the Kruger is the, the longest. Uh, they've been doing it here the longest. Um, and so it's very, very cool for me um, to see that um, this area has, has been op you know, operational as a, a game reserve for a long time, and so it is far more natural. Okay, you, you don't see uh, you know, fence posts and things like that, which in the Eastern Cape uh, can still be an issue uh, as we try to um, heal the land and remove uh, the effects of, of farming. Um, also, it's a totally different biome, um, something that, uh, that's an Albany thicket biome, so it is characterized by a lot of sweet thorn acacia trees, and I personally love trees, um, so being up here with all these big uh, marula trees, um, yeah, it's totally different, um, and it also um, makes guiding um, a bit different as well. Okay, so in the Eastern Cape, animals will use the thicket uh, to their advantage, they, if the, uh, lion makes a kill or a leopard makes a kill, they will drag it um, into the thicket uh, to get it away from uh, the competition of other predators. Whereas up here, leopards will, will take uh, prey up into one of these uh, beautiful big trees um, to avoid uh, you know, competition with other predators. So it's a totally different style of, of guiding. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's very, very cool to, to be up here now and experience uh, the Kruger. <coughs> All right, we're going to continue moving towards the hyena den, but we're going to link to Dave. I'm sorry, to James now. I'm Dave, and he's got some tracks to show you. It's nice when a presenter knows his own name. I always feel that that's a really good start. Uh, knowing your own name is an excellent way to begin with presenting. Right, over here we have got some tracks of the male lion that Morning Glory saw, I suspect. Morning Glory, I, I thought you said they were going from north to south. 
Uh, well, we did see some tracks there, but then these ones came all the way from the dam. Are you, is this the right one, Herman? Yeah. Is this correct? These ones have got, are going north into Biffles Hook, so we're right at the sort of northern border. There are a number of alarm calling cysticulars around here, so he might be lying in the bushes here. But we've picked the tracks up here, we're very close to the northern boundary. I didn't actually see them crossing, but I suspect they veer off. And then towards Simbambili, which is not too far from where we are now. And I suspect they've gone there on account of the fact that Rexon, who is mobile around here, has just picked up the sound, or has just told us that he heard a lot of lions calling sometime during the course of the morning. So we'll carry on in a westerly direction, heading along the northern boundary, see if these guys don't meet up with other chaps, and perhaps they're around Sydney's Dam, that sort of area, but we'll carry on and check. Isn't this amazing, though? If I look over here at this herringbone or Poganathra grass, I thought the grasses were done. I thought they were finished, they had done their seeding, they wouldn't flower again. These things have shot up as a result of the rain that we've had over the last three weeks or so. And they're just they're flowering again. They're putting up new stalks, new culms. And these ones are substantially larger than the ones we had before because we've had so much more rain. So the other ones were about that big, of the same grass species. And you can see they've got a lot larger on account of the rain, which I think is quite special. And here's another really big one. And this, of course, is the wondrous panic. Can you see this? Mm -hmm. with a wondrous panicum maximum and if you ever go walking in the bush out here you get yourself covered in this sugary sap it's actually delicious see when my fingers touching Mm-hmm. Huh, that stuff there it's like a sweet honeydew mm. so that's panicum maximum or the guinea grass right we're going to turn around and head up towards the northern boundary and then west to Sydney's dam. Oh, Sophia, you say, what are the smaller tracks next to the lion tracks? Um, you say they look like house cat tracks. They're not house cat tracks, Sophia. Um, you'll be surprised to hear, I'm sure, that there are not that many house cats. Of course, I would say none, but of course Brent did have that sighting of a ginger house cat a little while back. Your instincts are not incorrect, though. There, can you see there, Herman? Mm-hmm. That's what she's talking about. And I'd love to say that they are African wild cats, but I don't think they are. Although... No. These are genet tracks. So they're from probably a large spotted genet that's come walking down here. They're quite large genet tracks, but the reason I say that they are not house cats is that they're just not... Mm, I don't know about... Not house cats, I mean African wild cat is that I was going to say they didn't look quite exploded enough. Here they look quite exploded, so there's the back pad. Can you see my baby finger? Mm -hmm. And there are the four front pads. But if we move along this way, if you look over here, the toes just simply don't look enough separated from the back pad for it to be a cat track. I'm pretty sure that that is the track of a genet. Very well spotted there. Excellent job. It's going to turn into a gorgeous morning. And I don't, I mean, while we've been talking about winter now because we seem to be slightly obsessed by the weather in this place, um, I don't think it's going to be getting cold any time too soon. I think there's a front going through, or maybe the front end of a front. It's still going to be pretty hot for the next month or so. Now Taylor, <laughs> Taylor apparently is hot on the heels of something and so I don't want to uh, entertain you with my three-point turn. Let's head straight across to her and find out what it is that she is hot on the heels of. 
we've picked up the male lion tracks but we're just taking a very short break from tracking that male lion to stop and have a look at my favorite herd of zebra who seem to be accompanied by a giraffe today you can see the giraffe standing off to the right so both species incredible creature incredible eyesight just like the impala they know we're here they've already been staring at us but now we're going to try and go a little bit closer the giraffe has seen us, you can see he's actually looking at Herbie as he walks in front, and so of the zebra. Now we know this herd of zebra, they're particularly relaxed, but we'll have to see how they are after Brent's act, uh, antics with them the other day. But perhaps if we don't walk towards them like a predator, we'll be okay, and maybe they'll give us another glorious sighting. Are you ready, Craig? Let's go. Now we've got to get closer. We're going to have to go through the grass at some point, which I'm absolutely dreading, but I'll do it for all of you. You know, I'll be brave and I'll just take one for the team, you know, no problem. Get the carrot seed seeds in my socks and I'll, my legs will get nice and wet, but it's all right. No, I'm just seizing, of course. It's only water. And it's really lovely at the moment because the sun has just popped over the horizon and this lovely golden light is now flashing through the sea of grass and illuminating the zebras, which is nice. The giraffe seems to have found itself some shade behind a tree and is not illuminated in the sun. Right, Craig, in we go. In we go. Let's do this. So now the most important thing, zebras are quite funny. As I've had some really amazing encounters with, uh, not zebras, with giraffe. You can ask David as well about his giraffe encounters because we we've worked on the same property before, many, many years ago. And what we used to do is not fall over like I just did there. We used to zigzag towards the herds of giraffe. You walk there, then you walk there, then you walk there, then you walk there. And these massive herds of giraffe would be completely curious with you and you'd actually sit down in the grass. But the grass is very short. I think if you were to sit down in this, they'd panic a bit because you'd completely disappear. So you'd sit down and then the whole herd would sort of come around you. Not close, but about 20 or 30 meters or so, which is still pretty close to be surrounded by 30 giraffe. And it was just the most unbelievable experience. However, I don't think we'll get anything along the lines of that today, but we'll give it a go. We'll just casually stroll, they know we're here. I'm not gonna pretend that I'm not here. The giraffe is not very happy though. We'll just walk a little bit towards this marula where we can get the rest of them out in the open. And there's a pretty, ah, uh, thank goodness, animal pathway will save us a little bit. My shoes now are also a different color, which is quite nice. I enjoy them, this chocolate brown color. Let's see if our zebbies remember us. It would be really nice if they do. I'll be very happy about that. Okay, Craig, how are your shoes going? Come, zebra, come to us. No giraffe. Our giraffe friend is very nervous. He's running away now. Of all of them, he probably saw us first. <laughs> but our zebras don't mind. There's a couple of them that are coming closer towards us again, so we'll, we'll still continue our approach to the marula tree. Our giraffe friend, well, I'm not too worried if he moves away slightly. He'll eventually get used to us, probably a bit worried about us. Let's keep going. Now as we're moving around here, you'll actually see that the zebras will react to what the giraffe is doing. And that's just because, like Hunter's actually just asked, he wants to know if the zebra will use the giraffe as an extra pair of eyes. You are 1,035 million percent correct, Hunter. That's exactly what that giraffe, what the zebras will be using the giraffe for, and vice versa, the giraffe using the zebra for, is an extra pair of eyes, ears, and of course, an extra nose to help smell if there's any lions or anything coming around. But nothing so far, but this is the exact area where we had those lion tracks. Now we don't know if they're the same ones that uh, James has had or if there were a couple of males on the property. It wouldn't surprise me if there were a few of them. There was a lot of commotion going on last night. I didn't hear the zebras bleating though, I just heard him impala alarming. James said he heard it too. And apparently a little bit further west of us. There were some impala alarming just a moment ago, a couple of minutes ago. So Lex is on his way there in the car. We thought we'd stop and, like I said, just do a bit of a detour with these animals. Let's keep going. The zebras aren't too bad. They really don't mind us too much. They're more behaving and reacting to the giraffe's behavior, panicking unnecessarily.
There's a buffalo. That's a buffalo, Herbie. There's distress calls coming from a buffalo. And elephants. There's one angry elephant and they definitely there's in between it sounds like there's a couple of distress calls coming from Buffalo, but in that direction. I don't know what's going on down there, but we won't go walking into any angry animals, that's for sure. And you will see me stop every now and then. You see us do it all the time where we stop and we of course listen for sounds. I'm going to jump on this massive animal pathway now. Now, consulting detective, you're asking if giraffe prefer to live in herds. It depends. The giraffe have got that interesting social structure which we call temporary associations. So there's not necessarily any permanent bonding. Craig, I'm going to ask you to come this side just because that aerial is going to scare the, the zebra. So let me quickly walk in front. So we're doing this just because I want to get a cool approach. Now oh, they can see us, so I'm just going to jump out over here. Um, so they've got that interesting, sorry, the beh that uh, behavior called temporary associations where they don't necessarily mind it, but also they, they don't um, always stick together. So sometimes you can see a herd of 30 giraffe, the next day they may split up into two groups, into three groups, they all might go their separate ways. But typically you will see bulls, like that big giraffe, standing on his own. It's not uncommon. Look at the zebra right here. They're still habituated. Hi guys! Do you remember me? Probably not, but remember me? With the little foal? They don't mind us at all. Hi! Yes! Brent didn't ruin our approach. <laughs> of course I'm just teasing Brent. We always give each other gears in this camp. But look how relaxed they are. Here's some of them putting their heads down and munching away. They're now obviously watching us going, what on earth is that? But I think that they're more interested in the antenna coming off of the backpack because it is quite tall. So maybe actually you better be careful of the giraffe, Craig. That male over there might think you're a good looking boy. You never know. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> He's not quite tall enough to be a giraffe, but it's pretty high. But you can see. Not bleating, the zebra has actually completely turned its back to us and is now carrying on munching on the lovely long grass. And you can even, if you come a little bit closer, you can see the giraffe watching us very, very carefully through the trees, through the sickle bush. Hello, boy. Now, he's not the biggest male giraffe I've seen. We've definitely got some monsters out here. But he's getting there. His coat's starting to turn nice chocolate brown. He's tall, he's got a big muscly neck. So he's definitely a mature bull, and I'm sure he'll do a bit of challenging. Looks very clean as well. He looks very, very clean. I can't quite see his legs, and that'll be an indication if he has been boxing quite a bit. Normally they always end up with cuts and things around their legs from, from the giraffe chopping. And if you've ever seen a giraffe chop before at lions, you'll know that it's, uh, it's no joke, and you don't want to get yourself caught on either the rear end or the front end of a giraffe. Luckily they don't normally let you get too close. Let's go a little bit closer. I just want to see what they're going to do. This is, of course, now I'm just, I'm just having a look. Hi guys. Michael, you're wondering which is the animal that stopped here. See, now they've reacted. Those, those zebra have reacted to us. It's okay. So they do, they're not quite happy with me being here. So we won't go any closer to them now. What we will do is we'll probably just walk a bit to the right to get a view of the giraffe again. Let's do that. Oh no! Ah, and the thorns. Let's get, watch that one, Craig. Sorry, Michael, so you're wondering which is the easiest animal to habituate on foot? Um, it's a tough one. I've actually had the most amazing experience with the zebra. So I'm almost to the point where I'm ready to say maybe it's zebra that are easy. We've had a great, the leopards have been uh, quite easy to habituate as well, which is surprising. But I think that's just due to their mother's very calm, placid personality. And that's definitely rubbed off on the youngsters. Uh, it's, it's a tough one I've, whew, to try and say. I haven't done much habituation with animals on foot before. In the cars, the cats are the easiest. The lions in particular are very, very easy. The leopards then coming in. There we go. That's a cool view. So I'm not actually sure. Maybe giraffe. Maybe giraffe are also contenders. Like I said, 
haven't done too much. Giraffes spot you from such a far distance away. So you can't really sneak up to a giraffe. I don't know any guide that has successfully snuck up to a giraffe. They, you always get spotted. Oh, and there's an oxpecker. That's another one. We can add a red-billed oxpecker to our list of birds too, sitting on top of the giraffe's head. So we might try and do a bit of birding as we go about. But we're going to go and follow up on those impalas that were alarming and the distress calls that are coming from the distance. So I'm going to send you across to James, who's got a different kind of animal. We've come into the area that Taylor has sort of indicated where we think those distress calls are coming from and there is a water buck standing looking deeply undistressed by life. I'm going to sneak slightly forward. There we go. Oh, sorry. I'm going to keep, yeah, keep the camera on her. We'll try and get a decent picture of this. There rather special antelope. I just quite like that because she's so nicely hidden around here. Now from where Taylor is, the great zebra whisperer that is Taylor, of course a very fine horsewoman is our Taylor and therefore the zebras have picked up on that and like to spend time with her on foot. Perhaps she's carrying some sugar lumps in her back pocket. I don't think so. But she is now southeast of where we are and apparently there were these loud bellowing distress calls and I can hear nothing from where I'm sitting now. So I'm going to ask Kirsten to get Taylor to tell me where she would like to have a look. Isn't that a lovely picture? And if Herman Sorry, I'm just getting conflicting reports from the radio here from Lex and then from Kirsten. Um, what I was going to say is, Herman, if you zoom out a bit, just look how beautifully hidden that water buck is. I think they are the masters of camouflage out here. They're a humble antelope, of course, not fancied on any list of that people come out here and saying, I don't think I've ever in all my safari experience had a guest say, I'd like to see some water buck, please. But they are very, very skilled at remaining hidden. And indeed still, with only the heart-shaped nose twitching towards the recently risen sun. And the ears, of course, get a grid of the ubiquitous flies. There we are. I think we're probably a little bit north from the reports I'm getting, a little bit too far north. So we're going to continue down towards the south and then on to a triple M, which is the boundary between us, Simbambali and Arathusa. Isn't that nice? That was really nice water bucks, I think. Thank you for being so very confiding with us. Thank you so much. Now, of course, I keep thinking that we are coming into a field full of mole crickets because there is a dis sound of mole crickets coming from the inner workings of Jigger's engine. Now, Jigger and I have a love-hate relationship. In fact, I would describe it more as a hate-hate relationship because Jigger is not, he's not a car that has performed particularly beautifully for me. And so while I stare at the ground, hoping for some tracks, I'm going to start increasing my speed towards the west there and see if we can't pick up on what those sounds are. David, who is relatively tall, has... Fun. This is a terrible link. I'm not going to do that link because if we're always saying that about what the animal show you is. And so I'm just going to say that he has got something nice to show you. Thank you, James. Well, we have found our first interesting animal of this morning. Just behind us, or behind him is the sun, and what you have is a female giraffe. She's walking quietly through the grass. She's feeding. Behind her, we've got two youngsters. I'm sure we'll be catching up.
Okay, two adult females and two juveniles, it seems. So a small journey of giraffe. Giraffe are very quiet. I've heard a lot of rangers say that giraffe are mute. The only time I've ever heard a giraffe produce sound was when a small, almost newborn giraffe stepped out in front of the road in front of my vehicle. And I stopped to see that this baby it was just in front of my vehicle. And the thing was, it wasn't looking at me. It was actually focused on something next to me. And along the side of my vehicle came a lioness. And I thought this baby giraffe um, was a goner. And just before the lioness got to the baby giraffe, its mother stepped out of the bushes and produced a, a, a growl. It's the only time I've ever heard any sound come out of a giraffe's mouth. And if I were to best describe it, I'd have to go with an angry wookie. A really angry wookie. And she stomped the ground with her front legs. Like, of course, they karate chop with the front legs. And believe it or not, she actually managed to defend the baby. And the baby lived. So, yeah. Apart from that, giraffe quietly moved through the bush. Browsing, of course they use their height to get to the top of trees and bushes where almost no other animal could reach, except for maybe an elephant standing on his back legs, which does happen. Otherwise giraffe have the, the tops of trees and bushes all to themselves. summer day, how long do baby giraffe stay with their mums? That's an interesting question. Um, I don't think there is a fixed number with um, this sort of thing because it would have to do with um, the availability of resources. So there's no fixed number but approximately I'd say about a year and a half to two years um, a calf will be dependent on its mother and after that it will start to venture further and further away from her um, and possibly even stay, especially if it's a female, maybe in the same herd. Although they do live in what is known as a loose association and so they don't really have fixed herd structure. Dave, cameraman Dave, would it be better if I backed up? I think we've lost a visual of these giraffe. Yes. Okay, we are going to slowly move backward. Oh, Dave, what about the babies in front of us? Okay, we're going to move forward now. We've spotted uh, some young giraffe in front of us um, and we're going to slowly approach them. We don't want to scare them, of course. If the giraffe continues feeding, he's still in his comfort zone and that's what we want. We, of course, don't want to disturb him while he's enjoying his morning breakfast. Another adult female, our right side. Well, Cece wants to know how old these giraffe are. Cece, I'm going to have to say that, uh, of course, we've got a, a herd here, a number of giraffe. The adults, um, of course, are somewhere between about 8 to even uh, in their late 20s. But what we're approaching over here is a small baby. All right. And from my experience, if I were to put an age on this young giraffe, I would go with about six months old. Now, giraffe are actually born really tall. Almost at six foot at birth. It is a very large baby. And so often when they're born, they're tall and very thin. But once they get onto their mother's milk, they fill out quite quickly. And very soon you see them just after a few weeks or even a month, and you can't believe that they were just born. Well, this youngster's off by himself, which is, um, okay, here comes mom. Mom's approaching from the right side. Oh, little one's going to catch up. He's looking at us. 
If we were to sex that baby, I would go with male. Okay, of course, because I can see a penile bump, which helps. But otherwise, you look at the, the ossicles. Males have slightly thicker ossicles, whereas females have thinner ossicles. And of course, you can imagine um, when a baby is born, those ossicles could pose a bit of a challenge for a mother. And so, when they're young, they actually have a cartilaginous joint, and the ossicles are flexible. So if you see a really young baby giraffe, almost newborn, often those ossicles are still lying flat. And as they age, males a little sooner than females, they begin to calcify and fuse to the skull and become more rigid. Females, the ossicles rem will remain thin and tufted. Like you can see mom back there, she's got really thin ossicles. But with a the male, they become thick and they even begin to bald. They become bald, they lose their hair on top of the ossicles and that's because even from a very young age giraffe males will stand next to one another um, getting a good footing and then they will swing their necks and um, impact each other um, with the ossicles um, punching the, the lower ribs and sometimes even um, lower back and that causes balding. A majority of the, the battles you see with giraffe males, it's just sparring. Males um, practicing fighting, it's often just friendly. So it may look like they're hurting one another, but they are just practicing. And they can actually take quite a punch, even during their sparring sessions. But what all that practice is for is one day when two really big territorial bulls meet, and perhaps have a disagreement that they cannot resolve, um, they may go to battle. And that is when all the practice kicks in. Um, the battles um, can actually be deadly, believe it or not. Um, they swing their, their necks into one another, um, and obviously see the punching um, with those ossicles. And I've actually seen a male die from the fight. In fact, I've actually seen a fight where both males died from the same fight. And so, most of the time, giraffes seem to be very peaceful, moving around. But sometimes when there's a disagreement over territory and females, things can get nasty. Alright, this baby seems to be mixed feeding. So, I'd say it's still uh, nursing. But it's, yeah, having a, a little browse there on that bush. Good morning, Skip, from Texas. Right, you want to know, can a baby giraffe walk at birth? Well, not immediately. A baby giraffe actually experiences a bit of a failed bungee jump into life. Mom barely bends down. Baby can sometimes drop almost uh, six foot to the ground. It hits the ground with a thud, which helps to kickstart the respiratory system and also sometimes break the umbilical cord. And that baby, um, well, f first of all, if it doesn't uh, actually start functioning and uh, coming to life, mom may actually even give it a, a good couple of kicks. But in the African bush, there are a lot of uh, predators, there's a lot of danger, and a newborn creature, of course, uh, mom will be very protective and do everything she can um, to defend that baby, as we spoke about just now. But that baby needs to get on his feet. He needs to get functioning within hours. Because if he can't uh, get up and um, actually outrun predators, mostly uh, hyenas, spotted hyena would be a threat, as well as, of course, lions. So yes, a, a baby giraffe um, needs to uh, learn to walk very, very quickly. It's a make or break for them. So Skip, I hope that answers your question. They can walk um, within hours of being born. Anka, you asked how large can a giraffe get? Well, with females, they can reach a height of approximately 4.5 meters tall. 
and for males, oh, you get some males that can even reach 5.5 meters tall and weigh in at between 1.2 tons and even 1.4, up to even close to 1.4 tons in weight. And so, yeah, it's it's a really large animal. If you consider that a that's about the weight of a male black rhino. And although it's a very large animal, you won't believe how fast they can run. And maneuverable too. Sometimes uh, when giraffe have to maneuver through thickets and trees, they'll bend their neck right down and they can still uh, maintain a, a good uh, speed. And they're exceptionally agile too. Alright, the sun is rising now, things are starting to warm up. And of course, a giraffe, I find that they like to feed in the morning for a good couple of hours. And once uh, things really uh, start to, the, the heat kicks in and things heat up at about 10, 11 o'clock at the moment, um, giraffe often will go and stand out in the open where they can relax. They can use their height and their brilliant uh, sense of um, sight and hearing to keep a lookout for, for predators. And then what they'll do is they begin to ruminate the food that they have eaten in the morning. Brian wants to know, can giraffe sleep while they're standing? I would have to say almost. Okay, so after having some breakfast, they will browse in the early morning, like we're seeing now. And what comes after that is generally a drink. So they'll make their way over to a water hole um, where they will splay their legs and have a nice drink. And as I said, after that, things start to heat up. They will often move into a clearing, into a nice wide open area where they can relax and they can begin to ruminate their food and begin to uh, digest the plant matter that they've picked up in the morning. And while they're doing that, Often you will see giraffe um, standing there, they're not picking up food, they are ruminating. So they are um, chewing up that uh, plant fiber, um, the plants breaking up the plant cellulose and uh, ruminating food. And while they're doing that, it does often seem like they are in a almost trance or perhaps having a snooze um, on their feet. Um, and it can actually be quite amusing sometimes to see a bit of drool. In fact, not a, a bit of drool. I've seen drool uh, almost reach the ground. And so that is how they relax. Um, you must remember that in the African bush, there, you can almost never relax. Okay, you've got all these different creatures moving around, and a lot of them are very dangerous. And so wild animals, um, especially herbivores, uh, prey species, always need to be alert. Um, so that's it. During the heat of the day they'll relax and I would say yes, they do um, snooze on their feet um, or at least uh, go into a bit of a partial trance um, and relax. And at night, sometimes you find giraffe sitting down um, in a group, often in an outward uh, defensive position and they often will turn their, their necks around and put their heads on their backs and that's when they can really relax. All right, the calf still seems to be feeding, but mom is very focused on something in the east. She is, if you look at her ears, um, she's still having a chew, so she's not completely freaked out. But her ears are a pin forward, and she's looking at something. She's focusing on something there. I don't think it's necessarily something dangerous straight away, but maybe she heard something, or she thought she heard something, and she's just trying to... Um, pay attention to it now um, and investigate. When walking on foot in the bush, giraffe are an excellent indicator of danger. If the giraffe take their attention off of you, because generally when you're on foot uh, you are seen as a, a threat or a danger to these wild creatures. So when the giraffe stop looking at you and focus on something else, often you should also uh, pay attention to that. Now giraffe are very interesting. When they actually do spot uh, lions, you'd think they would uh, tuck tail and, and run, get away from them. But it's actually quite the opposite. A giraffe is a large animal. 
And as I said before, they can karate chop with their front legs and they kick out to the sides with the, the back legs. And it's a, a really large animal. And if, if you actually get, do get connected by one of those kicks um, for a lion, you're in big trouble. And so what a giraffe will do is, if they do spot danger, um, they'll actually move towards it. Okay, and that is so that they can keep an eye on the danger. If you can see the lion, you can monitor it, and you can defend yourself. If you lose the lion in the grass, it could pop up from behind and surprise you. And as long as a giraffe's on his feet, he can defend himself. If a giraffe slips and falls, it's in big trouble. That's what the lions want. So lions will actually startle a giraffe and try to cause them to panic and fall. And then they can get to them. Alright, we're going to enjoy these uh, giraffe a little bit longer, but we're going to send you over to Taylor, who has a slug to show you. We do have a slug, and I haven't seen a slug for quite some time. It's moving along the ground with its slime. That's a morning wrap for you, and yes we do. We have got a slug who is both a girl and a boy, and is leaving a very, very slimy trail behind it that is now covered in lots of sand. And I don't know if any of you, if you've got young children, or perhaps you just like to be a little bit strange like me, but I used to pick up snails and slugs all the time, I sometimes still do. And a slug in particular, once it leaves its slimy trail behind you, is the most horrendous thing to try and get off of your hand, if you've ever tried it. And the reason behind that is because the slime actually absorbs the water. So it becomes almost impossible, it just becomes slipperier and slipperier. Is that even a word? I don't know if it's a word, but it is, we can just make it a word today. But isn't that very cool? And you can see, look how it's all just coming out over here. But essentially, the snails and gastropods need that slimy substance to help them move smoothly along the surfaces. But not only does it obviously provide a little bit of lubricant to help it move a lot easier, if you've ever seen a slug or a snail going up a window, you must think that that's impressive. They haven't got, they've got one foot. But inside that slime again are fibers that help, well, stick to the glass so it doesn't fall off. But amazing, very similar to a snail. Essentially, a slug is just a snail without a shell. It's got the tentacles, the eye tentacles, and then the mouth tentacles, which you can see are working very, very actively this morning, trying to help it navigate. They also sense organs. And I reckon he probably started yesterday and about half past 12 in the afternoon and he's only made it this far. But don't worry buddy, your journey is almost over. You're almost safe towards the grass and he's actually going quite quickly. He's moving along. Oh no, your, your slime is just getting stuck on top of you. Look at that, isn't that really cool? And it always amazes me, I'm going to just touch it because I haven't picked up a slug for some time. Ooh, it's a weird. It's such a weird feeling. The top part, obviously, that's that's um, quite uh, robust and hardy, because it's exposed to the sun, so it's not soft and slippery like its underside. But now I've scared it. I'm sorry, slug, come out. And look how it's shrunk itself. Now you get different types of slugs all over the world. There's probably thousands of different species, but typically the ones that we get in South Africa are eating vegetable matter. And they're very much like termites. They're very important to the environment because they help decompose rotting vegetation. So next time you see a slug, I know that they can eat your plants, perhaps pop it on a compost heap and it'll be quite happy and then you won't have to poison it either. Even all these little things are so important. I'm sitting in the sand now playing. Bogu, you're wondering how do slugs produce that slime? Well, I, that is a very good question and I'll have to go and do further research inside there. But they must have some form of a mechanism inside their bodies that's producing it. But I will, I've got a very cool insect book that Steph has uh, um, borrowed me. And I did actually see somewhere in there they had a section on gastropods, on snails and slugs. So what we'll do is I'll have a look a little bit later, after, well, after breakfast, and then this afternoon we'll try and find another slug and then we'll try and go into a bit of detail about that. Or perhaps you know. So if you can shed some light right now, that's fantastic too. Let's learn together. Hashtag Safari Live if you know how a slug produces its slime. It's just really amazing how they're able to do that. And another interesting thing is that a slug can have over 27,000 teeth, teeth, not teeth, teeth, 
teeth at any one time and very much like sharks they're continuously replacing them so you wouldn't want to stick your finger in that slug's mouth imagine if we got giant slugs like the the shongololos the millipedes used to be over six feet a couple of million years ago imagine seeing a slug of that size goodness they would swallow us up whole and just munch them munch on us i think that's very much like a uh, um, an alien movie. I wouldn't want to put my finger in there. But I've never seen a jugs, uh, a jugs, a slugs ja jaws. Goodness, that's a tongue-tied part there. Blah, blah, blah. Let me try to get rid of that. But I have seen pictures on the internet before, and it's amazing. And if you want to see something else that's cool, is do yourself a favor and put jawless hagfish into the search bar of your your search engine, and just have a look how scary those things are. And that's what I imagine a um, a giant slug to sort of look like. But isn't that cool? <laughs> Coming right up to the camera. Careful, Craig. If it gets on that lens, we're not getting it off, and that would be an awkward view. Wonderful. Now I hope that nobody's going to drive over our slug. Yes. Jane B, you said that a slug is a homeless snail. You're quite right, it is. It's very sad. And that maybe that's where he's racing off to. Perhaps there's a two-for-one special on slug home somewhere. And uh, he's the first one there. I haven't seen any more snails around here. So you never, you just never know where these animals are going, really. But we'll leave the slug. Slug, good luck. Please don't get r driven over. You better pop it into fifth gear and get a move on. It's almost there. It hasn't got far to go. You can see. Have a look here. To the grass where it'll be safe. It's very exposed out in the open. Birds might come and eat it, though I don't know how tasty a, a slug would be to a bird, but I'm sure a desperate one would snatch up a little meal like that, and, it's, and particularly an inexperienced bird. We've been seeing a lot of juveniles around, so they may make the mistake of trying to eat that fella. We're going to keep searching. We're still following up on tracks and calls and all sorts of wonderful things, but I'm going to send you across to James now, who's got the, one of the most beautiful yet common antelope in Africa. Now, we have come into this area with our beautiful yet common antelope and we are in this area because Taylor and Herbert heard elephants making a loud noise in this vicinity and they decided they wouldn't head in here on foot because of course very upset elephants are not what you want to be seeing on foot. We then heard, Herman and I, some alarm calling from this area it's that very difficult block between Gallagher shortcut and Mvubu road and we're just trying to see if we can't find something in here we're going towards the old hyena den just off Mvubu road here just to see if we can't perhaps pick up on something naturally as we got into this area in the vehicle the elephants went and said nothing so we heard one shout from around this area and then nothing and then one alarm call from one of the impala. It would not surprise me to find that one of those male lions had gone to ground somewhere around here and they'd come across him. So let's just sort of drift gently down towards the drainage line here and see if we can't hear what's going on. I can't believe how thick the vegetation's got suddenly. You really, I mean, at the end of a drought season like we had last year, you tend to believe that, that the vegetation has changed irrevocably and that the dryness could never possibly be changed within the space of one wet season. But water is an amazing, amazing thing. And all around us now there's just this massive flush of abundance which of course is very beautiful on the eye but it's difficult to make or makes things difficult to spot because of course something the size of a male lion could quite easily just disappear in amongst the grass hello hunter uh, no, quite the opposite. You say, with the increased growth of vegetation, will it increase the, or will it attract and bring in greater numbers of prey animals? Hunter, well, I, that could be the case if this was localized, and but it's not localized. There's been a massive amount of grass and growth all over the Sabi sand, and in fact, in much of 
eastern South Africa and that means that the animals are in fact going to be dispersed far more widely than they would otherwise. That's because there's so much to eat all over the place now. So if it had been localized as it was at the end of the last dry season, remember we had early rains here where nobody else did, and that brought in that astonishing array of herbivores and the consequent influx of predators. But that ended sort of around, I guess, December time when everyone else started to get rain. And certainly that is the case now where this is what it looks like everywhere and that means that there's not going to be much in the way of attracting uh, species in here so the herds of buffalo will be spread out all over the place impala will be spread all over the place there's water on the ground everywhere which means that animals don't have to come towards the concentrated dams or pans so no exactly the, they're the elephants are they no, no, I can't see them. I just heard some cracking of branches. Let's just stick our heads in there. There is a spot to look over the to look over the top of the drainage. Ooh, that was a fairly large stick. Of course, I'm not sorry that I've inflicted that on Jigger. But otherwise, since I've last seen you, I'm afraid we've had a fairly unsuccessful. Just getting used to things again, you see. I'm just going to stop and listen here. Dr. Rob? While we're sitting here, you're saying, what other than a lion could make a buffalo give a distress call? Dr. Rob, a very large clan of hyenas might take on a buffalo. But it's almost certain that if there was a buffalo distress calling in here, that it was lions that have had a go at it. But I haven't seen any tracks of a pride. So maybe those males have had a go. They might be feeding on it right now. Alrighty, we're going to keep us on our search around here. David's got something that might fly away fairly quickly if you don't go to him right away. Okay, we have found a very interesting bird over here. And I'm going to throw this question out to the viewers. What do we have here? Can anybody identify this bird? Seems to have a grey back. And a long black tail, a short bill, seems to have a hooked bill. He's just repositioning. Dave, you come out, and we've got this bush a little bit closer, and we've actually got another one sitting quite close to us. All right, so send through your answer to with Safari hashtag Safari Live. What bird do we have here? Okay, it's just taken off again. Look at a screeching call, it's just sitting in front of us now. Short, rounded wings, a long tail, and a hooked bill. Just off the road there, sitting on that dead branch, Dave. Just over there. Small... Actually, sorry, that bush is actually alive. Just on the left, if you go off the mound, three meters, left-hand side, Should I move forward a little bit? Oh, there he is. Have you got it? Yeah. There you go. Alright, what bird is this? Send through your answer, hashtag Safari Live. I believe we have got some... I would agree with you, Ivan. I think that this is also a magpie shrike. I think it was Aaron. Aaron, Aaron, sorry, Aaron. I think you're right, magpie shrike. Um, I really enjoy birds and coming up to this area um, 
uh, I, within just two days, um, I've seen a huge amount of uh, new species, um, which is very, very exciting. I've heard that there are quite a few Twitchers that watch this show, um, and yeah, awesome that you guys can actually help me um, identify some of these awesome birds. Let's move on. Let's see what else we can find. Dave, why don't you keep the camera on the strike? I find with birds that if you just slowly drive past them, they will hold their position. But once you stop, I feel that your attention is on them now and then they will fly off. So we're just gonna do a slow drive by with the strike. Let's see, Dave's got awesome camera skills. Okay, let's see if we can stop oh, the morning sunlight. Good morning, Shrike. He's watching the ground now. This is a little predator. Shrikes, although they aren't very big, they're actually really aggressive hunters. Almost a bird of prey. They will hunt uh, just about anything that's about just about their size or smaller. This Shrike's careful. Oh, there he, there he goes. Into the grass, just to the right of that dead branch, Dave. Let's see if this shrike has found something to eat, some breakfast. It's very busy in the on the ground there. Could be a grasshopper. Well, I do um, in the Eastern Cape. <laughs> I haven't begun one for this trip because we've been rather busy. Um, and it's all actually a bit overwhelming at this stage. Um, so I think that I'm definitely going to have to start a new bird list for the Kruger. So the question was asked, do I keep a bird list? And the truth is, at this stage, no. I'm just enjoying them, but uh, I think it's a really good idea. I'm going to have to start a new bird list uh, for the Kruger. And so far, it is filling up very quickly. I think um, for the guys that have been here for a while, um, they are quite used to seeing all these amazing species. Um, but for I can give you another example. Um, for them, the local rangers get to see vultures all the time. Whereas in the Eastern Cape, because of the history of the property uh, and the land, there are almost no vultures anymore. Okay, and so there we actually see a lot of crows. We call them the Eastern Cape vultures because they fulfill the ecological role of vultures. So yesterday I got to see whiteback vultures uh, wheeling in the sky as they found a thermal and. Uh, so that is, it's fresh, and for me, that's so exciting. Um, so the birding um, up here is phenomenal. There is so much going on. Everywhere you look, it's just um, birds of every shape and size. It's really cool. So I think it's time to start a list. Okay, we've lost our strike now, so we're going to head back out onto the road um, and see what else we can find.